Hi, this is Chris. I'm the pastor at Wise Chapel and Ramburn United Methodist Churches. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I do hope that you've enjoyed our worship together and um, have been blessed by uh, seeing some of the videos over the past few weeks. If you have been, I definitely invite you to join us in person when we are able to. Um, we are so much better when we're together than we are when we're apart. So um, I definitely think that, uh, well, bodies matter and it's important for us to, to actually physically gather when we can. But um, in times when we can't, uh, we uh, do what we, we can. So it is good to see you. A few matters of housekeeping today. Um, first of all, we got a grant for a Zoom from uh, the United Methodist Church uh, for uh, Zoom, for the full package of Zoom, and I'll be figuring that out tomorrow, which is Monday, and hopefully mailing out to the church members um, some instructions of how we can have some Sunday school meetings and some small group meetings. I know especially the youth will enjoy um, getting together just to see each other's faces and be silly uh, together online. Uh, you've been doing some of that already, but um, we'd like to do that in a slightly more um, formal setting. And also, uh, if we are not meeting by Mother's Day uh, in a physical way, then we will meet at Martha's house for a parking lot church. Uh, so um, that's going to be our goal to kick off uh, in-person worship in our cars, in, in the uh, parking lot at uh, Martha's house. If you've been coming out to Wise Chapel, to our parking lot church there, uh, it's been a blessing and a wonderful thing to, to be with you. And uh, everyone is, of course, invited. That will be at 11 o'clock on Sundays from now until we are released to, uh, to go into the building and get out of our cars. So um, I hope that you have already watched the video with Mandy talking about the burning bush and Exodus chapter three, verses one through six. If you haven't, uh, watch that now. I'll try to put a link uh, down in the description. Uh, assuming you have, you know about the story of Moses and, uh, and how he experienced God. And uh, I have myself some stories of, of experiencing God. One in particular that comes to mind as I am here uh, at the Smithson home, uh, at our camp kitchen, is another time uh, years ago at Camp Sumatonga in a camp kitchen. I had a, camp, a camper. Her name was Lacey. Now, Lacey had uh, some physical problems and she couldn't go out and tumble and play the way a lot of other campers could. Um, when, uh, she, when I went to visit her at the hospital at UAB, they had to um, wheel her chart in in filing cabinets. She had a long and difficult history. Because of this, she felt singled out at camp, of course, one of the things, best things about camp is that you get to be outdoors and run through the fields and, and play games. And she felt left out of that. She had to watch it. So, well, I guess the statute of limitations for this is over. Uh, and we wouldn't have done this if her mother hadn't been one of our counselors also. But to make her feel special, we used to, uh, on Wednesday night, we would have her mother go wake her up in the middle of the night and she would sneak out and we would go to the camp kitchen. Now at Sumatonga, if you're not familiar with it, the camp kitchen is far away from the uh, cabins. It's all the way across the Tudor Bowl and down, uh, down the gravel, the chirp road, just a little ways. But I knew how to get in in the middle of the night and we would go and we would uh, enter into the dining hall and we would be sneaking uh, her mother and a couple of the other counselors and myself and Lacey, the only camper. And we would sneak in and we would go to the walk-in cooler and we would open it up. And we did this on Wednesday because on Thursday there was peanut butter and chocolate bars and they were good. And they made them on Wednesday and chilled them overnight. And they were sitting there in huge trays waiting for the campers the next day. And they would come in on Thursday and wonder why I 
about seven or eight of those uh, peanut butter squares were missing. Lacey said it made her feel like she was important. I just tell you that so that you know the context in which um, this experience with God happened. Uh, you can probably look at me and you'd be surprised that when I stuck out with Lacey to make her feel special, I did already know a little bit about breaking into the uh, kitchen in the middle of the night. Uh, Eric used to say um, about camp food uh, that it didn't matter if you were a 250 pound man or a uh, 95 pound uh, teenage girl, you got the same amount of food. So we found ways to make do. So it was not an uncommon thing, somewhere uh, around 11 to 11.30 for me to wait as soon as the boys were snoring well to go and find myself sustenance. And on this particular night, I had done so and I'd slipped on my tevas and uh, I left my name tag sitting there uh, beside my bed so that if I was uh, caught that they wouldn't know who I was. And I went uh, down, snuck down to the kitchen to see what I might could find. As I was coming back, I was crunching down the chirp road, trying my best not to make a lot of noise. And I heard a voice. Take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. So I took off my shoes. And that was all. And I continued walking. There was no bush burning, no, uh, no fire in the sky. And I walked barefooted on that church road. And I'm so grateful when I felt the grass of the sugar bowl on my feet. The next morning, Winston came running up and said at about 11.30 last night, I'd forgotten to cut the sound system off in the assembly hall and when I went in, it was an angel. That was the best Thursday at camp that anyone's ever experienced. God was there. I was just doing what I did every Wednesday at camp. It was an everyday experience for me. I wasn't out there actively seeking an experience with God and actively hunting for God's voice. But somehow I was included. Now, Moses had lived the first 40 years of his life as the son of the Pharaoh's daughter, the grandson of the Pharaoh. One of many, not the next ruling Pharaoh, but still in a life of, of privilege. Uh, he was raised by his parents. He knew about who he was. Um, you can read about that uh, in the first couple of chapters of Exodus. But at 40 years old, his life changed. His situation changed. His, he had to find a new normal, a new every day. And, uh, and he did. Just as we are right now finding a new normal, hopefully a temporary one, but uh, a new way of, of being everyday selves. Well, Moses' new everyday self was that of a shepherd. And he would take the sheep out uh, and uh, let them graze and take them to water and bring them back. And this was the normal uh, normal that he had found. And as he experienced this day after day for 40 years, right, 40 more years, it all was just, um, I guess, boring and routine. It was the same, generally. And so who can blame him when one day he looked up and he saw a fire on the side of the hill Oh, that's different than yesterday. I think I'll go check it out. 
And, and it was very much more surprising when uh, the bush was on fire and you saw the shrubbery and, and it's burning and, and, and it doesn't burn down, uh, which is very surprising. I have tried to replicate this on my own and have not been able to, uh, to cause something to burn and, and not um, and, and not be consumed by the fire. Uh, I've done that enough times that uh, Brother Dwayne has banned me from, uh, from using fire, so I won't have any in today's uh, video. But uh, quite an interesting thing that he's found here, and as he goes and he, uh, to see what's going on, he hears a voice, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. And he does. And God continues to talk to him. And he has this experience with God. I especially enjoy the fact, I told you that uh, in my experience when I heard that voice that I was standing on a church road and you can imagine someone of uh, my uh, girth uh, trying to walk across a church road barefooted. Well, I like to imagine an 80-year-old Moses uh, who shortly afterwards as he's talking to God was told to throw his, sta throw his staff down and it turned into a snake and a uh, and uh, thinking about bare feet, hot sand, snake, 80-year-old man trying to avoid the snake. I think it's just one of the most hilarious images that, um, that I can get out of the Old Testament. But there is Moses, and he's experiencing God, and he wasn't looking for God in, uh, at that very moment. And he was, hadn't gone to a special place that he knew of as holy, holy ground, like we go to our churches sometimes expecting to find God and there's places we go expecting to find God. But right now we really uh, have difficulty gathering to find God in the ways that we're used to. So we're finding in you every day. But just like Moses, we may find that one day for no reason that we know, we run right into God. God is there in our new normal, in our um, mundane existence, in things that we've done every day for weeks. What we need to do is notice. Notice when God shows up. We need to not be too busy with other things or with cares of this world to think that um, something new and different that happens is not worth checking out. And when we find ourselves having an experience with God, when we see God in, in, in our life, not only do we need to notice that God has chosen this as holy ground, we also, well, we need to respond now, why in the world did Moses take off his shoes? Isn't that a good question? I mean, the, God told him to. That's enough reason. But why would God tell him to? Uh, for years, I thought, and, and you probably uh, uh, also have uh, thought about this, uh, I connected this, as I think it is connected, with uh, some ideas in the Middle East of, of how they behave respectfully toward one another, and if he is on holy ground, that is, if he's on ground that God owns, um, entering into, if you will, God's home, he was uh, told to do something that uh, that you would do if you were respectful entering someone's home in Moses' day, which is remove your shoes. Uh, wearing, um, wearing your shoes through the desert, uh, of course, they get very, uh, very dirty. We've talked about this on Monday, Thursday. We talked about washing feet. So it was not an uncommon thing, a sign of respect to remove your shoes and not, not track things in. Your mama ever tell you to go back outside and not track, track in with your muddy shoes, leave them on the porch? That was the idea that I had associated this with. The only one who got to walk into the house with their muddy shoes and not get yelled at was dad. Why? Because it was his house. And mom didn't yell at dad in front of the kids. Don't know what she did when the kids went to bed. She might have given him an earful then. But we didn't own the house. It was our house, but it was really our father's house and our mother's house. And, and so as a sign of respect, um, 
and because mom worked so hard to keep it clean, we took off our shoes. And, and this is, goes, idea goes back, way back into Moses' day. And so Moses took off his shoes as a sign of respect. He's not tracking mud into the presence of God. But there's another idea that maybe is contained in this, and I didn't notice it until I was reading Ruth in context of, uh, of preparing to talk about Exodus chapter 3. And in Ruth chapter 4, won't get into everything about Ruth, um, just, uh, just know I'm going to be reading beginning in verse 7. Uh, as Boaz is redeeming, uh, is, is redeeming Ruth. Um, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm a transaction. The one took off a sandal and gave it to the other. This was the matter of attesting in Israel. The one took off the sandal and gave it to another. Um, taking off the shoe was somehow a transactional uh, thing in the ancient Parts of Israel. It was it was even lost already by the day that Ruth was written, but in the days prior to that, it was it was a thing. It was something that they did. Uh, why? Well, a number of scholars have, have written about it, and uh, one thought that stuck out to me as I was reading was um very similar to the idea that well, who owns the house can walk the mud in. Everyone else takes off their shoes. The one who wears his shoes and has the right to walk across the land. It's his land. He has the right to, to traverse it. And when they sell the land, and that's most of the real transactions that are taking place uh, in, the, in this particular day, when they sell the land, they remove the shoe and give that right, hand that right over to uh, the new landowner. So the, the taking off the shoe and the, and the giving it uh, giving it over was a, a sign of giving up my rights to property, giving up my rights to, to, to a claim. And there's Moses in front of the holy God as the bush is burning. And he takes off his sandals. There is a sense in which he is giving something up. He's he's renouncing a claim. No, this isn't my grazing land. This is God's holy land. No, this isn't uh, my every day where I carry the sheep by. This is, a special, this is a God's special day where God has chosen to meet me. This isn't my life in which I choose the way I shall live. This is God's life in which he will tell me how I should live. He gives up the right to traverse, if you will, his own path. And he enters into a contract. You could say a covenant with God where he will be following God's path. So if in this time you find yourself confronted by God and in a moment where things are holy, somewhere perhaps you didn't expect it, but a place of God's choosing and a time of God's choosing, by all means, pay attention. Enjoy the experience with God, but also well, take off your shoes. You don't have to physically take off your shoes but unless God tells you to. But remove your right to say how this should go. How often do we pray? As we pray, we tell God what we want God to do. Take off your shoes. Give up control. It's God's path for you to walk. So let's walk it. Hallelujah. Amen.